Welcome again to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are so close to the end of this great study on the book of Psalms. We're on lesson number 12, worship that never ends. Now these printed quarterlies that you can get are literally years in the making. So if something on the Sabbath School panel or in the quarterly speaks to your need this week, know that that's God saying, I knew your needs before you even knew about them. Mm -hmm. Now we really are a family of God and it's my privilege to introduce four of the children of God will be sharing what they've studied this week. On my left, we have Ryan Day. Amen. I have uh, Monday's lesson, Sing to the Lord a New Song. Mm. Which you can do, I well, know. Sure. And then Jill Morricone. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. On Tuesday, we look at Lord who may abide in your tabernacle. All right. And John Dinsey. I have Wednesday, declare his glory among the nations. Which we all should do. And finally, Pastor James Rafferty. Closing it up with Thursday's lesson, when God does not delight in sacrifices. All right, I'm curious to know. Pastor James, would you be willing to pray for us today? Yes, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to study your word, to call upon the Holy Spirit, to guide our hearts and our minds and to be with our viewers. Please bless and sanctify mm -hmm. this presentation, each one we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, week after week, you've been hearing us announce to you that you have the opportunity to reach out and receive the notes that we share each week. And by now, I know many of you have been doing that. And it's just one email that you send, and then each week they'll just come to you automatically. So you don't need to email us every week. You can make yourself a nice little folder in your email and then move those files into that folder so they're perfectly organized. And you can look back and go through each of those notes anytime you want to come back to them. And the email for that, if you want those notes is SSP, Sabbath School Panel, at 3abn.org. So anytime that you send that email, you'll start getting those notes automatically. So let's take a look at Sabbath and Sunday's lesson in this week, which deals with the topic of worship, which applies to each one of us. Now, Sabbath's lesson makes a distinction that I noticed in there. I'm going to highlight it briefly. The first distinction is that worship is more than just actions of songs and singing and music and sermons. God wants worshipers. And that's people. He doesn't just want actions that we pour out with a label of worship on them. Now, for me personally, the, the favorite definition of worship that I've ever heard, and I don't remember where I heard it, so it probably is attributed to somebody, that worship is a life lived bowing down. It's your whole life submitted to God and uh, saying, Lord, I want to worship you in everything that I do. Romans 12, 1 makes that clear to me. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, that's your whole self, a living mm -hmm. sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that continues day by day, not just giving something and walking away, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, the second distinction comes from the memory text, Psalm 104, 33, that says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God and I while I have my being. Worship here is intimate. It's mm. personal. It's singular. It's individual. It's something that each one of us from the core participates in, but it's not just individual. Worship is more than that. It unites us as a congregation. And on Sabbath's lesson, it ends with Psalm 111, verse 1, that says, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly mm. of the upright and in the congregation. And that's what we're doing here. We're illustrating that, all of us worshiping together. So let's move to Sunday's lesson, which focuses on Psalm 134. It's the second shortest psalm in the book of Psalms and the second shortest chapter in the entire Bible, next to Psalm 117. It's just 24 Hebrew words, less than half the length of the Lord's Prayer. Because sometimes it doesn't take a lot of words to say what needs to be said, and more words would ruin it. You don't have a marriage proposal with an essay. 
You just say what needs to be said and they either get it or they don't. And if they don't get it, well, then this wasn't for them. So <laughs> Psalm 134 is for those who already love the Lord and just a few words are necessary and it brings up all those feelings of connection and that desire and that longing. This is the final Psalm of the Songs of Ascent. Mm -hmm. So this is the last one of the pilgrimage songs. It's the one you sing on the way out. The feast is over. You've been refreshed by God. You've interacted with friends that you have not seen in a long time. You're trusting in God, leaving the temple in the unity that you sang about in Psalm 133 just mm -hmm. before. And so Psalm 134 is a lingering farewell. I don't want to leave. Have you ever had a lingering farewell? Maybe looking back on those days before you got married and you say, oh, I, I, I want to talk to you longer and more. The time's been so sweet, I don't want it to end. And that's what Psalm 134 is about. We sometimes take our spiritual blessings for granted mm -hmm. and we long for them to have them back after they're gone. That's what Psalm 137 is about. But Psalm 134, this is in the moment. And it says, I've, I, I'm in the presence of God and I don't want to leave it. It starts with the word, behold, look, see, investigate, explore, open your eyes, don't blink, don't miss a moment because it's gonna be gone so soon. Take it all in. Look at what God has done to you so you can have reasonable praise that you return to him because you've seen his glory. The worship of God is not from compulsion. It's because you have seen him. And as you behold him, say, Lord, I don't wanna miss any of the duties that you give to me, any of the tasks that you have for me to come close to you. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night, by night, stand in the house of the Lord. All you servants of the Lord is talking about two types of servants. There's the Levites who took turns through the year ministering in the temple. And so we leave the temple encouraging those ministers who are going to stay behind. And we need to encourage the ministers in our congregation. Pastors, elders, deacons, those who do visitation, those who are in charge of ministry, it can feel lonely to do that and people come and go and not that we need to build up a big head on those people, but to say, we are encouraging you, we're praying for you. First Chronicles 9 verse 33 talks about these ministers. These are the singers, it says, heads of the fathers, houses of the Levites who lodged in the chambers and were free from other duties for they were employed in that work day and night. And so sometimes we might look with envy and say, you get to stay here in, in this place that, that feels so holy. I have to leave. You can stay here. Carry on the ministry. Praise the Lord for me in my absence. But while I'm here as a pilgrim of God, I also am one of those servants of the Lord. I'm leaving soon and I, I don't want to leave the temple courtyard. I know my time is limited. And so looking back at these, these times that people came to the feasts, I know my time is limited. So I'm going to be around the clock worshiper. This is my last night here. I'm going to squeeze out every moment. Psalm 84 verse 2 is the longing experience. My soul longs, yeah. yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. Psalm 34 is the actually their experience and it doesn't disappoint. Psalm 84 verse three says this, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. And where is that? Where is the sparrow and the swallow making their nest? even your altars, O Lord of hosts. And so the worshipers are envious of the birds who get to stay there. They make their nests up in the, the places where they fly in. Say, I want to do that. I've got to get home because there's tasks to take care of, children to take care of. There's, there's things I have to do, but Lord, this is where I want to be. Hmm. So what do they do while they're there in the sanctuary? Verse two, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. 
regardless of what your feelings are about lifting up hands, maybe you're just like, oh, I, I can't get myself to do it. it. It's a picture of being totally devoted to God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. My hands will praise you. My feet will praise you. My eyes will praise you, everything about me. Psalm 141 verse two says, let my prayer be set before you as incense, my prayer. And now the parallel phrase, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Lifting your hands is prayer. First Timothy 2 verse 8 says that we should pray with lifted hands. Lord, I'm offering myself and I'm here. I want to receive from you. I give to you myself and I receive from you yourself. Psalm 134 is spoken by people who would never miss a prayer time. These are the kind of people who there's a 5 a.m. prayer time. They're like, yes, I'm going to be there. Maybe your church has a prayer time like that. When, back when I was teaching, I always wanted to have a prayer time at like three in the morning. <laughs> right. You get the people who want to come. And these are the ones who you got to kick them out after the end. The mic cables have all been put away and the lights are getting turned out and they're still in there, not because they're having a social time laughing with friends, but because they want to be with Jesus. Like Genesis 32, 26, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Yeah. And such a person was Anna in Luke 2, 36 to 38. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years old. She's not of the Levites, who did not depart from the temple, but served the Lord with fastings and prayers day and night. And it's because of that, that the Holy Spirit was able to impress upon her heart. He says that in that instant she came, and she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. I want to note that you don't have to go to the church necessarily. There's beauty in, in congregational unity and, and the Lord gives us blessings there. Some people can't make it to the church, but we can any place where we are say, Lord, I'm offering myself to you. I don't want to leave your presence Amen. ever. And they did this three times a year, not once in a lifetime. They did this repeatedly and still it felt like this for them. And maybe not everybody. Maybe your spiritual life has gotten to the point where you don't feel this way. At one point, the Sabbath was so powerful to you. You remember the day that you learned about it. That was years ago. And now it's, it's started to feel like a duty and a responsibility. And uh, you need the Lord to refresh you. And this is what Psalm 134 is leading you to that experience, saying, Lord, refresh me again with the experience of longing to be in your courts and never wanting to leave there. Psalm 27, verse four, and there's a number of other ones that say the same thing. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And we love how Psalm 23 ends there. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I pray that you will dwell there this week. Amen. 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 Thank you so Amen. much, Pastor, Brother, Professor, Professor, Professor Surgeon. <laughs> I, I just love, I, I just have to take all those in and that's not to build up the man, but the God in the man, because you, you always do such an amazing job yeah. at bringing out the word of the Lord. And I appreciate that brother. Mm -hmm. My name is Ryan Day and I have lesson, uh, on Monday's lesson entitled, Sing to the Lord a New Song. And uh, this, I'm glad Shelly gave me this lesson because it's just right down my alley. And I love, I love music and I love singing and I love praising God. And that's exactly what Monday's lesson is all about because we serve a God that is worthy to be praised. Mm -hmm. And he has given us so many reasons and so many uh, uh, opportunities to worship him and praise him. And so we wanna do that indeed. I'm gonna begin uh, right in the opening segment of this lesson, which actually takes us to a series of different Psalms. And you you start to see a theme among these particular texts. And I'm just going to start reading through these and I'm going to make some notes and some comments along the way. But you will see uh, the common theme among this and then we'll make some comments as we go along. So Psalm chapter 33 and verse 3. I love this. It says, sing to him a new song. And then it says, play skillfully 
with a shout of joy. And so we'll come back and make some comments about this particular section. But you'll see right here, it says, sing to him a new song. And you say, Ryan, I, I don't even, I'm not a songwriter. I don't know how to write songs. I don't, I'm not really a singer. I don't really know how, uh, where to even start to sing to him a new song. Well, this isn't necessarily saying that uh, you must write a brand new song and you must sing that newly written song uh, and create your own. That's not necessarily it. As we go through this, we'll make more, more sense of what he's actually saying here. Psalm 40 in verse 3, again, notice the theme. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. I love it. So he will put a new song in your mouth. What does that mean? We're getting there. Psalm chapter 96 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 96 verse 1 and 2. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new, new song. Mm. Sing to the Lord, all you earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. And so again, sing to the Lord a new song. And then Psalm 98 verses 1 through 6. This one's a little more lengthier, but you'll get the the point as we go through here, Psalm 98 verses 1 through 6. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Now, you'll notice what we're about to read here in, uh, from, from the end of verse 1 all the way through to verse 6 provides us reason for this new song. What is this new song all about? Why will God give us a new song to sing? And here is the reasons why. Uh, verse 2, it says, The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness. He has revealed in the sight of all the nations. He has remembered his mercy, his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. In verse 4, shout joyfully to the Lord. I'm reading New King James Version. All the earth break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Verse 5, sing to the Lord with the harp with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn, shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. And so again, what are the reasons for why God will give you this new song and why you would burst forth in singing such a new song? Because you are having a new experience in Him. Mm -hmm. you ha he has spiritually awakened you. He has set Amen. you on fire. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have gained a new, uh, a, a new respect, a new honor, a new love for the Lord that perhaps you didn't have before and it brings forth this new song and of course uh, Psalm 144 in verse 9 it says, I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you. You know, David was a, was a harpist, and so that's right down his alley. Uh, Psalm 149, verses 1 through 5. Again, on this same theme, Psalm 149, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. With them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord, notice it says for, oh I lost my place. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautifully and uh, he will beautify the humble with salvation. And then verse five says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Have you ever sing a song in your bed? I know that's, usually that's not the place where you do singing, right? You usually do. You're sleeping and you're resting in the bed. But I can tell you, I have a I have awakened a many a morning. Me too. I mean, uh, just wake up from my sleep, eyes wide open, head still on pillow, covers still on, and all I have, I wake up with the song in my mind. And I'm and God bless my precious wife. She's laying next to me trying to get the, the rest she needs, and I can't help my sing. To just break, just break forth and <laughs> praise God from whom all blessings flow. And then she'll roll over and go, oh. <laughs> <Still sleeping. laughs> God will give you a new song, a new experience when he awakens in you the joy and the love and the excitement of what he has for you in life. God is for you, not against you. Uh, the lesson brings out that the Psalms summon people to sing a new song. What is a new song here? The reason for the new song is the fresh 
fresh recognition of the Lord's majesty and sovereignty over the world and gratitude for his care and salvation as the creator and judge of the earth. Deliverance from enemies and from death and God's special favor towards Israel are some of the more personal motives to sing a new song. While other songs also praise the Lord for his loving kindness and wonders, a new song is a special song expressing, as I said, rekindled joy and promise of renewed devotion to God. And so this is a new song. It's something special. Not necessarily, again, a written song that you're going to publish and that someone's going to say, maybe it will be. Maybe God gives you that gift of, of, of the ability to write a brand new song of the new joy and the new love that you have for Him. But it's an experience. It's the reawakening or the rekindling or the explosion of praise and worship and love and gratitude that you have for God. And each and every one of us will experience that and can experience that if we simply just give our whole and devote our whole lives to Him. Now, I do want to highlight something here. You also not only found the theme throughout those texts of sing to him a new song, sing to him a new song, sing to him a new song, but uh, I want to also go back and re reiterate here what we see in Psalm 98 verse 4, except I prefer the, the King James Version on this one. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing his praise. We see this all the way through Psalm 33 verse 3, uh, play, play skillfully and notice, with a shout of joy. Uh, Psalm 98 verse 4, shout joyfully to the Lord. Verse 6, shout joyfully. We see this all the way through. Let the children, this is uh, Psalm 149 and verse 2, let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Amen. Uh, Psalm 149 verse 5, uh, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud. And of course, we just quoted uh, Psalm 98 uh, uh, verse 4, King James Version, make a joyful noise. You know, we need to learn. Yeah. I'm just saying, I, I, I don't want to be sound critical or judgmental at all, but the Lord has placed this up on my heart. God's people are a people of truth. And yes, we must worship him in truth. But does that all is all that it says? It says and worship him in spirit as well. Now, there's a whole there's some complexity to that, although it's still simple. We don't need to overcomplicate what it means to worship him in spirit. But if you are full of the spirit of the Lord, you will naturally uh, sing and, and to worship the Lord with joy. But I feel like some of us, we've lost that joy when we praise the Lord. I, I have the wonderful privilege and honor of traveling and and um, and, and worshiping worshiping with, with all of God's people in many different states and countries and, and all different kinds of churches, uh, mainly Adventist churches. But I can tell you, uh, it, it breaks my heart. I was at a church, just for example, not too long ago. And, and it just kind of encompasses the experience that you'll have at many different churches. But I'm up on the rostrum, I'm looking out, and we're singing that song. Mm. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I look out as I'm up there with my, you know, and then I look out and I see the faces and everyone, and I know that it's a spirit of the, and then what really got me was the next line because it says, there's a sweet expression on each face. And at that moment it hit me, I thought, oh my goodness, Lord, we've we have lost what it means mm -hmm. to praise you joyfully. I can't imagine you having a genuine on fire experience with the Lord. You're standing in his very presence. And in, don't we believe that? We believe when we're gathered together, we're in his presence and he's right. with us, right? I'm not saying become Pentecostal, run the pews, do cartwheels and flap and all those other things. I'm simply saying we need to learn what it means to be joyful and yeah. worshiping yes, God. You right. cannot stand Amen. in your creator's presence and say, great is your faith. Faithfulness, as if you're at a funeral. Mm. We serve the God of the living. That's why great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. That's why uh, 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 Psalm 150, I don't have time to read it all, but it talks about praising him with all of these different instruments, even a dance. And I'm not talking about doing the Macarena or the disco or all of those things like you would find in a club, but simply being joyful. This, this expression of joy, praising him with loud symbols. What if I came into your church with loud symbols? Some would say that's inappropriate. But, but David is saying, praise God. It says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We need to learn to praise Him, yes, but praise Him with joy and with the genuine experience that brings about and expresses that new song in our life. Mm. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord with a new song. We'll be right back in just a moment after a short break. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. 
Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back. We are now moving right along to Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Daniel and Ryan. What an incredible lesson. I just feel like we're having church today. We could go home right now and say amen. Praise the Lord. If the Lord could only help us incorporate the mm -hmm. principles of what we're learning today. On Tuesday's lesson, I even forgot my lesson, we're talking about Lord who may abide in your tabernacle. Mm -hmm. For this, we're going to Psalm 15. So turn with me to Psalm 15. We find 10 characteristics, moral qualities for those fit to be guests in God's house. Those ultimately who will live with him in heaven. According to the Jewish Talmud, all 613 commandments of the Torah are summarized here. Now, don't ask me how that even occurs because I don't know how that could happen, but that's what they say. Let's look at Psalm 15.1. Psalm 15.1 and Psalm 24.3 have a very similar question. The question is this, who can live with God? Mm. Who can live with God? Who can worship in God's house and live with him throughout eternity? Psalm 15, 1. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell? That word means to settle down. Mm. Abide and dwell. Who may dwell in your holy hill? And then Psalm 15 follows with these 10 characteristics of God's worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Psalm 24, three, I just wanna read that verse too, cause it's very similar. It says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And it follows with that one verse, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. Mm -hmm. So let's look at Psalm 15 and we're gonna look at 10 characteristics of God's worshipers. Psalm 15, verse two. He who walks, what's that word? <coughs> uprightly. uprightly. Mm -hmm. I'm reading New King James. He who walks uprightly. Characteristic number one, walk in purity of heart in holiness. Mm -hmm. That word uprightly means in the Hebrew, complete, perfect, without blemish or spot, undefiled. It's the same word used in Genesis 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. That word right. blameless is the same word here, uprightly. It's the same word used in Exodus 12, verse 5. Your lamb, this is talking about the sacrifice, shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Are you holy? Are we holy mm -hmm. in order to enter God's presence and be in his house? Takeaway number one, repent and receive a pure heart, a clean heart from God. We read this on a previous um, Sabbath School panel lesson, Psalm 51, David's prayer of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and all of that mess. Psalm 51.10 says, create in me a clean heart, the word bara, used when God creates something from nothing. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. None of us are holy of our own merit, but we come before God and we ask him for clean hands and a pure heart. We ask him that we can walk uprightly. We can be pure and holy in him. Characteristic number two, keep reading verse two. He who walks uprightly, that's holiness, purity of heart, and works righteousness. Characteristic number two, you and I need to be covered with Christ's righteousness. Right. Now our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. So we're not right. talking about our righteousness. Takeaway two, ask God to cover you with his righteousness. Mm -hmm. I love Philippians three verse nine. It says, be found in him, not having my own righteousness because my own righteousness is nothing. Right. My righteousness comes from the law. 
but we need to have the righteousness which is through faith in Christ, that righteousness which is from God by faith. So receive his imputed and imparted righteousness by faith. Number three, we're still in Psalm 15, verse two, the last part speaks the truth in his heart. Mm. First, we walk uprightly, we're blameless and holy before God because God can create in us a clean heart. Second, we work righteousness, meaning we receive the righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. Third, speak the truth in his heart. Now, many times this can be associated with speaking the truth, and but the next verse really talks about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going a little different direction here and bear with me a moment. I believe that this really talks about you and I need to live from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Your outward actions need to match what's in the heart. Don't live a duplicitous life. Right. In other words, whatever's inside eventually comes out. Mm -hmm. We need to be honest with God, with ourselves, and ask him to change us from the inside. Mm -hmm. So what is on the outside matches the inside. Have you ever met somebody who is a certain way in public, maybe a certain way when you walk through the church doors, but yet inside the heart is dirty. Inside the mind is defiled. God wants to clean us from the inside out so that what is inside is the same as what we present outside. Who we are inside is the same as who we are outside. Mm -hmm. Characteristic number four, the first three were positive. Now we're kind of switching to a negative. We're in Psalm 15 verse three. He who does not backbite with his tongue. Mm. Don't gossip about other people. Don't slander people. Mm -hmm. Don't blacken their reputation. Mm -hmm. Speak kindly of people, both to their face and behind their back. I worked once with somebody who uh, slandered, I think, everybody that came in contact. Mm -hmm. They were kind to their face, and when I was in their office with them, they were very kind. Say, Daniel, you'd be in the office, very kind to Daniel. As soon as he walked out the door, the criticism started. Well, mm. I can't believe he's such and such. What yeah. type of person is he? Be kind to people. Right. Do not gossip about people or slander other people. What you say to their face should be the same thing as what you say behind their back. Yeah. Keep going, characteristic number five. Nor does evil, we're in Psalm 15, three, nor does evil to his neighbor. You and I are called to treat others kindly. Now the neighbor can be anybody. It can be an enemy. It can be a neighbor. It could be a coworker. We are to act with kindness and goodness toward all. Mm -hmm. The next one is very similar, but it brings it even closer to home. Still in verse three, the last part of verse three, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. The New Living Translation puts this verse this way. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Mm. You ever notice that sometimes it's hardest to be nicest to those closest to you. We can be nice to those maybe we work with or in church, but when you get home, how do you treat your spouse? Mm. How do you treat your children? How do you treat those who are closest to you? Treat those closest to you with kindness and respect. Now we go to verse four, Psalm 15, four, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. Sometimes we respect power, position, money, advantage, class, even when it's ungodly. We are called to respect those who follow God, mm -hmm. no matter their position or if it rewards us or not, because God is no respecter of persons. Respect the things, respect the people who are God fearing. Keep going, we're in verse four, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. And IV says, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. Do what's right. Keep your promise, keep your word, even when it's difficult. Sometimes it's hard to follow through on those promises, hard to keep your word, but do it. Keep going, we're in verse five, Psalm 15, five. He who does not put out his money at usury, NIV says, who lends money to the poor without interest. Now, of course, the Bible's clear. You can take interest from strangers. We're not talking about you can never uh, take interest. 
But it's very clear that we are not to take advantage of other people. Be considerate of the poor, not charging them interest. Be kind to them. Finally, number 10, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. New Living Translation says they cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Don't enrich yourself at the expense of the vulnerable. The very end of it says, he who does these things, who walks in integrity and pureness of heart and righteousness and speaks truth in their heart and speaks kindly of others and treats others as they would want to be treated, as God would treat them himself, he who does these things shall never be moved. Literally shall never stagger or totter. Those are the characteristics of the people who will be in God's house and dwell with him eternally. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing to hear each and every one of you. God is doing a work that we cannot even understand. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is John Dinsey and now we are on Wednesday's portion of the lesson and it is entitled Declare His Glory Among the Nations. Now as I read the lesson near the end, the author said something powerful. Uh, the author is Dragoslava Sandrak, and I said, wow, she has come upon something very interesting here. And this is really the focus of how I am going to go through the lesson. At the end of the lesson, she uh, states, the universal appeal of Psalm 96 to worship the creator and the judge is reflected in God's final gospel proclamation for the world the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. In many ways, this psalm seems to incorporate this end time message, creation, salvation, everlasting gospel, worship, and judgment. It's all there. So let's go. Psalm 96, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Now you've heard Pastor Ryan talk about this and uh, we continue in verse 2, sing to the Lord, bless His name, proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all peoples. Wow, this is powerful. Uh, so I bring the question to you, why should we declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among the people? What does that do? That does something good for you when you're, when you're declaring the good news, when you're worshiping the Lord and declaring His wonders among the people. But also, it is an invitation. As people hear you talk about how good God has been, mm -hmm. they are saying, wow, I, I seem to be missing out. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting That's these right. blessings. I'm not seeing this in my life. So I see this like an invitation, like it says in Psalms 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Mm -hmm. And as they hear you declaring God's goodness to you, they're going to say, wow, I, 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 need, to, I need to serve the Lord and, and see those blessings in my life. So praise the Lord. Now I said that this is connected in some way, as the author said, to Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. So uh, let's go to Revelation 14, verse 6. Notice, because it, uh, we read in verse 2 that we are, verse 3 actually, uh, and 2 and 3, that we are to proclaim the good news of His salvation, to declare this among the nations. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, mm -hmm. tribe, tongue and people. God loves the world. And He is uh, calling upon us to wake up and do the work that we are supposed to do to bring this everlasting gospel, the good news of salvation to the nations, to the world. The whole world needs to hear God's message of salvation. Mm -hmm. Just take a look around. Even if you just take for a moment to see what's going on in the world. You see that there's chaos, there's crime, there's, uh, there are horrific things going on, wars in different places, and the people need to hear that mm -hmm. good news, the good news of salvation and that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Let's go to Psalm 96 and we move on now uh, to verse, uh, so let's go to verse 6. It says, honor and majesty are before him. 
Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Now, I want to uh, say something here about this because, you know, Pastor Ryan was talking and the same, same thoughts came to my mind about giving the Lord glory and strength. And uh, I, have, I have also seen this in, among the Spanish congregations I'm where mainly I go. And there are some people that you take a look around, you're sitting there and they seem to, you know, I think I've heard Danny say they sucking on lemons. And they're like, <laughs> I say, what's going on? Why are the people, they seem to be so down. Mm -hmm. And even in the singing portions, and I picked out a song that I, I have seen this. Uh, they're singing a song that calls them to rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. And their face is uh, saying something completely different. They're not rejoicing. They seem to be somewhere else. Uh, like they don't understand what they're even singing. So I encourage you to before, when it's time to sing, <laughs> ask the Lord to put a joy in your heart, mm -hmm. the joy of His salvation, rejoice in His salvation, and really worship the Lord in spirit and in truth with your whole heart. He is longing to see his people really rejoice, rejoice that you have such good news and that he has been so good to you. Mm -hmm. Now, in verse 7, it says, Give to the Lord, O families of the people, give to the Lord glory and strength. Verse 8, give to the Lord glory, do his name. He is due all the glory that you can possibly bring out of your mind and body. And it says, bring an offering and come into his courts. Mm -hmm. I remember one day that, uh, you know, you get used to these ideas of using the credit cards and debit cards and checks and all these things. And I got to church and they says, time to collect an offering. And I'm like, I didn't bring an offering. I felt so terrible. Mm -hmm. And this thought came to my mind that I should not present myself before the Lord empty handed. The Lord has been good. Uh, and we should be prepared to bring an offering, you know, uh, mm -hmm. plan before you go to church to bring an offering because the Lord has been good. Mm -hmm. Boy, I, uh, I remember a parable that somebody said once. I was not going to say this because of time. But according to the little story that somebody made up, uh, somebody was in heaven and they go, oh, they look at all these mansions. That's beautiful. Oh, look at those wonderful people enjoying that. And, and you know, you, where's my house? Where's my place? And they kept, oh, yes, it's, it's this way. Just follow me. And the angel finally comes to this area and uh, he says, wow, look at all these. It, this one is yours. And it's a little rundown little place. <laughs> not so nice. Uh, it didn't look so wonderful like the others. And why is my place so bad like that? Why is it so small? And, and he says, we did the best we could with the offerings you brought to the, to, to the Lord. And he says, you know, that really is, has a teaching in it. What if the Lord would treat you like you treat him? Mm. Mm. I don't think you will be happy about that. Consider how good the Lord has been to you. So let's go to, uh, it said here to give to the Lord glory. Revelation 14, 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give. Glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. This is all there in Psalms 96 as well as we saw. Uh, let's go quickly to Psalms 94 and uh, 96 and uh, uh, let's go to verse 9. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, tremble before him all the people. Mm. And we read to uh, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Mm -hmm. And we are to worship the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. This, is, this uh, uh, Revelation 14 verse 7 has a link to the fourth commandment because remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. A great connection here with Psalms 96 as well. The Lord is good to everyone. The Lord is good to everyone. I remember now we're talking about judgment here. Notice what it says in verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the people 
righteously. Mm -hmm. Yes, you and I need to remember, uh, as it says in Romans 14, 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. We need to live understanding that we're living in the time of the investigative judgment mm -hmm. and live as close as possible to the Lord. Ah, Psalms 96, verse 11. Uh, it says, let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the fields be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord for he is coming. Mm -hmm. For he is coming to judge the earth and he shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. There's good news in the judgment. It says here, it's talking about rejoicing because the Lord is coming to judge. Mm -hmm. There's good news for God's people because as the record is cleansed of all their sins, there's great rejoicing knowing that you are completely cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is good news in the judgment. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. I really, I love the idea of finding the, the messages of the three angels in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. now, that's so powerful. And thank you, Jill, mm -hmm. for reminding us of the characteristics of those mm -hmm. who are going to dwell with God. And Ryan, thank you for reminding us to sing a new song kindled with joy and love to God, mm -hmm. even if we wake someone up. <laughs> <laughs> My wife may be talking to you about that sometime later. <laughs> and Daniel, thank you for reminding us to hold on to God's presence, to hold on to God's presence. My name is James Rafferty and I have Thursday's lesson. It's entitled, When God Does Not Delight in Sacrifices. And we might be making a little bit of a turn here from the up focus um, that we've had so far here, but we want to look at Psalm chapter, or, yeah, Psalm chapter 40 and specifically verses 6 through 8. That's what the lesson quarterly brings out. Psalm 46 through 8. Sacrifice and offering thou did not de desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And the, qu the question is asked again, when God does not delight in sacrifice, when God does not delight in sacrifice is when sacrifices are used in forgetfulness of what the sacrifices actually point to or what they mean. Mm. That these sacrifices really point to Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the world and the ultimate heartache and pain that sin has brought to the heart of God. And when we forget that, when we forget that connection, then those sacrifices become meaningless. And those sacrifices, as the lesson quarterly says, uh, are sacrifices that God does not delight in. You know, the law, the law of sacrifices pointed to the ultimate sacrifice. They pointed to Jesus Christ. And Paul kind of knocks this out of the park, so to speak, uh, in the book of Hebrews. In fact, the Apostle Paul is quoting from Psalm 40 in Hebrews chapter 10 when he explains the fuller meaning of the sacrificial system. So let's take a closer look here in Hebrews chapter 10. We'll just begin with verse 1. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers once purged should, not, should have had no more conscience of sin. So Paul is talking about the ceremonial law. He's not talking about the law of God, the Ten Commandment law. He's talking about the ceremonial law. And clearly he's making a, a distinction here because he's basically saying this law was a shadow of things to come. It wasn't the reality. The reality was Jesus Christ. If this law had been the reality, it would have severed our conscience from sin. We would have actually had no more relationship with sin. That's what Christ has come to do. But in those sacrifices, verse 3, there is a remembrance made again every year of sins. For it was not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 5, and here it is where he's quoting Psalm 40. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me, speaking of Christ, and burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to do thy will, O God. 
above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. So definitely a law was taken away here. And the New Testament talks about this in Colossians chapter 2 and, and other places that this law was the law of ceremonies, the law of sacrifices, the law that pointed to Jesus Christ, the law that was pointing to the, to the reality of Jesus. And then it says that, that this law was taken out of the way, the ceremonial law of sacrifices was taken out of the way so that the second, Jesus Christ, the reality could be established. And it's through that reality, verse 10, that we are sanctified through the offering of the body of of Jesus Christ once and for all. So this is really what it means uh, that these sacrifices are not pleasing to God. It's, it's uh, reminds us of the experience in 1 Samuel chapter 15 where Samuel is talking to Saul who's basically trying to justify preserving the animals of the Amalekites that he was supposed to destroy. And he says, you know, we preserved them because we wanted to give them for sacrifices for the Lord. Well, in reality, they wanted to give them so they could save their own. It was selfish through and through. And Saul himself, the king, is not taking responsibility as the leader, as a leader should, but he's trying to shift the responsibility of the people. And so Samuel Samuel says, no, 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 no. Has the Lord great, a, as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. The reality is what Samuel is talking about here and it's the reality that Saul is rejecting. And we see this same principle in the New Testament. If you think about what all of this means, this reality in Jesus Christ, you want to look to the New Testament because the Old Testament gospel was found in the types and symbols of the sanctuary. That's where the gospel was found. And so in a sense, in the Old Testament, when they made the sacrifice the end and didn't let it lead them to obedience, they were turning the grace of God, the gospel of God into a license to sin. And that's what we see in Jude chapter 1, uh, chapter 1 of Jude, because that's the only chapter there is in the book of Jude, <laughs> verses 3 and 4. Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation typified in the sanctuary service. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness or a license to sin and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The types were pointing to Jesus. When you deny the reality of those types, you're denying Jesus Christ. You're turning the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ into a license to sin. Now there is a remedy and the remedy is a new covenant relationship with Jesus. So back to Psalm 40, where we want to see this relationship uh, in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, uh, exemplify this relationship for us, the relationship that he wants us to follow him and have with God. Verse nine, I preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Verse 11, let not thy loving kindness, let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. And that word continual is tamid. The tamid was the regular, the daily, the continual. It was pointing to a relationship with Christ, as Jesus says in John 15, an abiding relationship in Christ where we continually depend on the Lord. This is what Jesus did. He said, of my own self, I can do nothing. zero, nothing, nil. I can do nothing. And then he goes on in verse 12 and says, for innumerable evils have compassed about me. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me. Jesus here is speaking of his experience in Isaiah chapter 53, verse six, you know, where he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, where in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he became sin for us so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the, heads of my, the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. John 13, uh, 19, 34, Jesus died of a broken heart, blood and water as the spear thrust went in. Be pleased, verse 13, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me, O Lord. Make haste to help me. 
Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. That happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, by the way, for that moment when Jesus, the glory of God, shone upon him. Let them, verse 15, be desolate for a reward of their shame and that say unto me, aha, aha. Let all that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee and let such as love thy salvation say continually, there's the Talmud again, continually. This is what God wants us to, to say as we have this relationship with him, this experience with him, the Lord be magnified, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer, make no tarrying, O my God. So we see in Christ this experience that is accentuated, that is talked about, that is described by the psalmist, by David, the son of David, uh, became the reality of these verses, of this experience. Just a closing thought here from the Desire of Ages about the sacrificial service in um, pages 588 and 580, um, 589 and 590. Little did the priests and rulers realize the solemnity of the work which it was theirs to perform. At every Passover and Feast of Tabernacles, thousands of animals were slain. Their blood was caught by the priests and poured upon the altar. The Jews had become familiar with the offering of blood and had almost lost sight of the fact that it was sin which made necessary all the shedding of the blood of beasts. They did not discern that it prefigured the blood of God's dear son, which was to be shed for the life of the world, that by the offering of sacrifice, and that by the offering and of sacrifices, men were to be directed to a crucified savior. Jesus looked upon the, the innocent victims of sacrifice. He saw how the Jews had made these great complications, scenes of bloodshed and cruelty. In place of humble repentance of sin, they had multiplied the sacrifices of beasts. As if God could be honored by a heartless service. That's what we were talking about earlier, a heartless service. The priests and the rulers had hardened their hearts through selfishness and avarice. Their symbols pointing to the Lamb of God, they had made a means of getting gain. Thus, in the eyes of the people, the sacredness of the sacrificial service had been in a great measure destroyed. The indignation of Jesus was stirred. He knew that his blood so soon to be shed for the sins of the world would be as little appreciated by the priests and elders as was the blood of beasts, which they kept incessantly flowing. And so God is calling us to look at, at the uh, picture here of the sacrifice of those, uh, that sacrificial system and, system and see in it the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Wow, amen. amen. God has given us some encouraging instruction through these Psalms. What a blessing. We have time for a few final comments. Absolutely. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Let all the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Tuesday we looked at, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle. It is a serious thing to enter the presence of God, but it is a joyful thing because He is the one who is our righteousness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Psalms 96, verse 2, saying to the Lord, bless His name, proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. And when God does not delight in sacrifices, when we forget that those sacrifices point to the love in this and the great gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me conclude with Revelation 7, 15, thinking about dwelling in the house of God. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Mm. And he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. And so this is worship that never ends because it's not something in the past. This is something we're looking forward to in the future. Now we got one more lesson in this study. It's the last lesson, number 13, called Wait on the Lord. I look forward to seeing you as we study it next week.